Okay, welcome to Australian Primary Health Nurses Association. We'll just wait a minute to let everybody in. Okay, I think we'll start. So today's webinar is on the principles of sterilizations with our guest speaker and subject matter expert, Margaret Jennings. My name is Lisa Sinkins and I'll be your facilitator today. Also on our panel is Sarah Drew, who's the nurse programs manager for the infection prevention helpline. So we would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to the land, sea and community. We pay our respects to them, their cultures and to the elders past, present and emerging. Okay, let's start. Today's webinar focuses on sterilization process and part of the infection prevention helpline in association with Murray PHN. Our service is designed for all clinical and non-clinical staff who work in general practice, community pharmacy, Aboriginal controlled health organization, and is supported by three subject matter experts. If you have any questions around infection prevention and control, we encourage you to call us or go to the webinar, pay, uh, to go to the web page to submit a web form with your questions by using the details that are currently displayed on the screen. The helpline doesn't just focus on COVID. You may want to uh, you may want to ask information on updating your current policies and procedures, so please contact us free to ask all your IPC questions. Okay, so I'll start by introducing our um, guest speaker, Margaret Jennings. Margaret Jennings is a microbiologist who worked in the clinical and research bacterial viral immu immunology laboratories. Margaret is an educator and consultant to general practice with her own company, um, and offers education on site to staff around infection prevention control. So the content of today's webinar looks at system processes, the environment in which you're, you are sterilizing in, what your workflow should look like, what the sterilizing process is and your documentation. We will then have a Q&A session at the end where we will answer some of your questions. Please sub submit any of your questions into the chat and if we cannot answer them, Today, we will answer them offline and send them to you in an email at a later date. Okay. So your learning outcomes today um, should be, be able to create in a protected sterilizing environment in the workplace, applying those processes and system, systems to reduce the contamination, in standing, understanding the importance of applying those um, correctly for the sterilization process and evaluating the documentation. Sorry. Okay, so over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Lisa, and welcome everybody. I'm greeting you from um, Wurundjeri country, and today's the 26th of August. And I guess of all the things that you're doing today, you're thinking, oh my God, I've still got to fit in the um, instrument reprocessing. So the term I will use for the total process is instrument reprocessing. Number one, please make sure that you're not trying to reprocess anything that's disposable. Um, so not, not, not acceptable. And I do still find from time to time, people say, oh, I, I don't know where the original label was. So why don't we have a look at some of these system processes. I'm actually just gonna give you an example. And uh, this is literally a cook's tour of um, around um, the process that we do. Um, and I'm, the sort of tips that I'm gonna give you, they're also reminders, but they're probably gonna help people who have had questions and haven't yet asked them. And remember, you can use the helpline to ask. So the first thing is just to be mindful that we don't use our, um, our examination gloves when we are washing um, instruments. Um, for those of you who can't wear um, you know, the uh, utility um, latex, you can use the uh, vinyl. And you can see it's a thicker, it's, you know, they're both thick gloves. So we want thicker gloves. In fact, this is what I recommend for drying. We shouldn't actually be using any latex. So it's quite common in practices to have, you know, two pairs of gloves, one for washing, one for drying. And it's acknowledging that I'm going from a dirty situation to a less dirty situation. And that's the way our workflow moves. So there's some tips there. These are not left hanging over the sink. 
They are dry and um, popped. You can see I've got one on a little bulldog clip and it's popped on a cup hook inside the cupboard underneath. So is this one and they're not together. They're kept quite separate and we wash them while we're still wearing them, pat them dry and take them off. So that was just a little clue there. The other thing I think we've moved a bit on as well as wearing a um, plastic apron to do the actual washing is how about we have a look at our eyewear. Protecting our eyes is important and your ordinary prescription glasses just don't cut it. So I would be expecting people to either wear goggles or how about the face shield? Because that will give us a bit of protection. And I think the place is awash with face shields at the moment. And so you can have your face shield, just wipe it inside and out, uh, and that can be put away. It can be yours or it can be shared. If it's gonna be shared, it really does need to be washed. So there's a few clues there. With the um, workspace, look, very few places I go to, probably only one in five, have actually got a dedicated area, you know, room for instrument processing. What I can say is for some people, it's actually an unacceptable situation that they're looking at and um, they're doing things like trying to process instruments while patients are being seen two metres away from them. So where you don't have a separate space, I would expect that there be no instrument processing occurring in terms of washing and drying and, and cooling instruments while anybody else is in the room. And that would be you know, an expectation. So there shouldn't be anybody coming up to your sink to wash hands while you're trying to wash instruments. It's, um, I guess, bad enough that a sink might even be shared uh, among those um, processes. But for those of you who've just got that one sink, we'll talk about that in a secchi. Um, I would expect that everybody who does instrument processing is trained and it's absolutely okay to be trained by the person um, themselves who's trained and is um, training the staff. So whilst, you know, it's fabulous if everybody goes off to a course, we've got to be realistic. But I do expect that um, people have been shown the correct way. And there is a correct way. And I've um, handed over to um, Sarah and Lisa some sheets of paper that might be useful for people um, to request, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of um, changing, what things are changing? Well, I can tell you that I don't think we'll be doing any manual cleaning within three or four years. It looks to me like uh, we will be moving on to um, instrument uh, washers and you can get quite small ones, but you know, there's got to be enough throughput for me to justify that in my practice. But that's something on the horizon that we won't continue with manual cleaning probably after a few years. Um, then I would say to practice, have you got a recipe? Like, how do you all do your instruments, clean and sterilise them? And people go, oh, it's in our head. Well, it's really important that we're all following the same, I think it's 14 steps that I've put on, on my list. Um, yes, we have to change things from time to time, but we don't change the order. And so sometimes it's a case of I can wash and dry and I can store them in a container, can't have enough plastic containers, and I'm probably not going to package and sterilise till later on this afternoon. What we don't do is leave them um, in the sink. We don't leave them wet to dry. We don't leave them in the steriliser ever. We never use the steriliser as a cupboard. And then the risk assessment. How safe is this for you all? So let's move on and we'll see if we can address, um, put a dipstick into some. So I mentioned that this area really, from the time that you're washing the instruments, it becomes contaminated. And this is why I don't want anybody near me. And I mean within a meter or two, because as I'm scrubbing or rinsing, I am sending um, droplets into the air and they land about a meter or so out. So I think you can now see if you've got some boxes of gloves and, and paper towel up on the wall right in front of you, they're going to be contaminated every time. Um, and the fact is you're going to have to wipe over a metre out, not the floor, but a metre out every time you process instruments. And that's to keep that clean. You will see that um, we don't really use tiles and grout so much in that area anymore. It tends to be fairly smooth splashbacks, but that's not what you're looking at in your practice. So that means you're going to have to be really good with the detergent and paper towel, unless you're filthy rich and you've got um, detergent wipes. So there's a lot of cleaning that goes on. The, the sinks that I leave or the sink that I leave when I finish the processing is cleaned. Detergent and paper towel and dried back, never left wet. I've got to think about the person coming to use that sink later on. 
Um, I Fabulous if you've got two sinks, but I don't, again, always see that. But you can use a washing bowl, which you'll wash and dry at the end, but you must have a sink for rinsing the scrubbed, you know, the scrub washed instruments. We've got to use a sink because you must have running water to rinse your instruments. You can't dunk them into a bucket like that and get all the detergent off. That step is really important, the rinsing step. So again, $2 bowl from the $2 shop. Um, now, what about the proximity of where you're going to be packaging the instruments in relation to where you're um, rinsing them? Again, the splash is going out a metre and too often do I see instruments being rinsed and then just put onto a towel. Well, the next time I rinse another instrument, all the bugs and droplets are just going to land onto what I've just rinsed. So I'm a bit of a fan. Of, I feel like I'm the, you know, um, Avon lady or the Tupperware lady here, but um, I'm a bit of a fan of something cheap as cheap, like a, um, a, it's got a rack in it. So we don't have much space. But uh, where we've rinsed the item, we can quickly take the lid off and put the items in there. It's a rack. It's got a rack so it can drain. Um, I'd always recommend that. Then I know that I'm protecting the instruments. And, of course, when I've completed my washing, I'll then pop, take my PPE off, put on my drying gloves, and then I'll move along. So we always move from dirty to less dirty. Some people say we move from dirty to clean. Believe you me, there's nothing too much clean, probably. Nothing super clean about... Um, when I'm drying the instruments. So sort of have some sense of it's not a perfect situation. I wouldn't want to be drying instruments while somebody next to me is washing. So thinking about let those droplets, the droplets fall really within seconds. We're not talking about aerosol particularly. So um, a lot of you just have a metre between your second sink, if you've got a second sink or your sink, and the start of your steriliser. I would like you to push your steriliser. We can't do anything with the sink, but maybe push the steriliser or at least make sure that there's nothing else uh, going on in that space where I'm actually um, packaging the instruments because we just do not want extra material falling on our cleaned instruments, nor on the other side of the steriliser where I'm cooling my load, do I want people walking through that area? And I'll give you a bit of a clue. On the other side of the steriliser is usually a wall. Um, but I would say to you, please keep pushing things away onto the cleaner side of the steriliser by just bringing something like a cleaned trolley and um, so that everything is moving in the one direction. It's a little bit of a disaster if you start bringing processed items back to the packaging area. It, there'll be mix-ups and that's not great. So I think that's enough on that slide. There. In fact, literally, you can see the recap there, that we've got the reprocessing happening from left to right. I really just don't see many people with uh, four, four benches able, but fabulous if you can. If, you've got, um, if you're in the position of reviewing your space, big for a dedicated space. And it's not shared with the linen trolley, with boxes of gloves. We have nothing in this room. It looks so bare. And I know the managers out there, because I work a lot with managers, will say, there's not much in that room. Why can't we sort of put the linen skip, the waste bins, the boxes? No, this has got to be low dust and low traffic movement. And yes, please, a really good fitting door. <laughs> That's if you've got that, um, that chance. But I guess putting your eyes on and seeing this as oh, it's an area that I'm going to contaminate a couple of times a day. And that's when you will have to wash. You really do need to wash the instruments a couple of times a day. So I think we've got um, the inefficiencies in the reprocessing step. I kind of divide this into two spots. Uh, once I start to clean, I can stop once I have dried, but I cannot just leave things to air dry or I can't just leave them in there to, to, you know, to soak. Um, what you might do is, and this is perfectly okay, um, the item doesn't have to go into a, a soaking solution. Um, if you're going to be washing it within an hour or two of using it, um, in any case, instruments need to be safely removed of gross visible soil. You can usually do that by wiping your um, scissors or forceps onto a bit of paper towel, something like that. They don't have to, you know, sit in, sit in a solution particularly. So um, it may be that you can say, I can train people to do the washing and drying 
and I can train people to do the packaging, loading, running the steriliser, taking it out. They're really two quite separate steps. Great if you've got time to do the whole lot, but you really don't want people sitting around waiting for a steriliser cycle to go. That would be a huge inefficiency. Okay, enough, I think, for the next one. Um, in terms of start of the shift checks, we put that in because you and I know that what I thought I was going to, to do tomorrow when I get to work tomorrow is often completely up, made upside down because we've had emergencies and instrument processing is the process that you can juggle a bit. So I don't think I'd be so inflexible as if to say, I must do this at 8.30 when I get there. Um, now, if it's a process that means that I was going to wrap and, and process a clean load because I actually need the instruments at 10 o'clock, well, then you do need to do that. But that's, I think we're all flexible enough to work out, I think I might actually have to do this at 10 o'clock because I've got too many wound dressings to do today. So um, that is often the, the way we work. So it's not uncommon for people to have washed instruments from the evening before, dried them, and commit to packaging and doing the load when they come in the morning. That, that's really a good piece of time. Um, and usually you don't generate any instruments till the, you know, the first couple of patients have been through. So I, I find that's, that's good, but I'm not working in your um, space. Certainly you've got to make it clear to everybody that when you commence the cleaning, you really ought not or cannot be um, interrupted until you finish the drying. Now, you've also got to give people a sense of how long that is. And if I'm just washing 10, 12 instruments at lunchtime, I can really get through that probably in 15 minutes. If I'm using an ultrasonic cleaner, yes, it's now going to take 30 minutes. But I don't have to be there for the whole 15-minute cycle for the ultrasonic cleaner. So I find literally everybody that I work with is just so fabulous at um, organising their time. They've really got it sort of worked out. Um, and then for packaging, and you can't pre-label, you can't sort of um, uh, prepare a load and do it four hours later. We prepare the load, that is we package it, seal and label just before we pop it into the steriliser. Otherwise, we have a few disasters. People think, oh, there's a load that's been done and they start, you know, taking instruments that haven't been done. This happens. So, you know, somebody needs to be there to control that part of the process. Similarly, once I set the steriliser, I can't just go home. Um, the standards require that we're there to remove the load. We cool it and cake rack. Now, cake rack is your friend. So I would be putting, putting the whole tray onto the cake rack and air can circulate underneath. And that would probably take to, uh, to, to cool. It must be dry when you take it out of the steriliser. But to cool, it might take 10, 15 minutes. And you would use that time to ascertain, uh, you know, did the cycle work? And with very clean, dry hands, you can then pick up uh, the pouch. So never, ever, ever touch a, a warm pouch because your bugs from your hands will just go straight through. So, yes, if you're going to sterilise, somebody needs to be there uh, for 15 minutes after the cycle finishes to open, take out, cool, record results, put away. We never leave anything out. So I think um, I've covered a bit of that. Sarah, Lisa, this, um, this part of the process can sometimes bring people a little bit undone because um, they're visited by people who want to sell them all sorts of fancy systems and they're going, oh, I'm just coping with the um, steriliser and now I've got this, these guns with labels and do I need all this sort of stuff? Just go to first principles. Most practices I see are putting seven or eight um, pouches in a load, which would be a maximum generally. Um, you don't have to have a fancy gun. You can even buy the little piggyback labels if you want separately. You don't have to have this magic gun. It looks terrific, but it's you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars and might be great for dentists who are doing eight and nine loads a day. And that's really not our situation um, in general practice generally. Um, on an average, practices that sterilise might be doing a couple of loads a day. Um, and so it's quite easy to just grab a marker pen and write, obviously, outside. You'll see the glue line there. So outside the glue line, 
you can write date and batch number. And, the, and it should be the full date. It should be 2021. I know most of you have probably used every instrument within three days of doing it, but sometimes we do instruments that are not sterilised very often, which also leads me to mention use-by dates. So we actually don't use use-by dates in instrument processing. We're a bit harder than that. We say you've got to be able to store the instrument correctly. If you put it into a cupboard, it's to stay closed. It's to fit well. The cupboard doors are to give a good fit. It's not to be made of chipped wood and stuff like that. So it's usually laminate. And if you can't achieve that, get a big plastic container that clips and it's locked. And don't let dirty fingers with gloves on rifle through it. That's just for special people who've done their hands to get in and get that. Um, what I can tell you is that the, in terms of, again, not used by dates, but checking, have I stored this correctly? Did I put it away as soon as it was cool? Did I put the newest stuff that I've done to the back? Don't use paper dividers for your instrument sets because that just releases fibre. We use no paper or cardboard um, around this particular system. So we use plastic dividers if needed. Um, what you'll notice, and especially when you're training people, I tell them this, when you, before you put the um, pouch or pack, I should say, flexible packaging, correct terminology, um, before you put that in the steriliser, it feels quite um, pliable, the plastic. When it comes out of the steriliser, it feels brittle. That brittleness can increase, and it can actually make the um, pack quite prone to splitting. And that increases with time or can increase with time and handling. So I have a little one-liner in my policy that says, if I haven't used an instrument over, let me say, six weeks, something like that, I'll actually pick it up with clean, dry hands, check it. Does it still feel okay? Yes, it does. So I would actually have a policy of checking my unused packs every six weeks and determining whether I should reprocess them. Um, with the tracking and... and up till recently, we tended to call tracking and tracing quite different things. Um, tracking was just where I was able to put into the patient's record um, the, num the, the cycle that that patient's track had been in. And so therefore, you could look back to the cycle results, which you've got to keep you know, for a long time, same as the patient's records. So the cycle results that you've entered into your logbook, they are now linked to the patient's history. That's why we keep them for so long. Um, tracing used to be the actual instrument. So an instrument might have a special you know, number, but we tended to use that more with scopes in the, you know, the um, endoscope type area. So today we collapse it and we just say tracking. What is it? Well, it's where I put details of the pack that I've used on that patient into their history or into a special um, tracking book, it's whatever you like. So I'm just going to now wrap up and why do we use tracking? It's in case we might have to go and chase somebody because we find out that a cycle didn't work. And we've actually got to, um, it's our duty to let the patient know that the instruments were not um, adequately processed. I wouldn't say fail, but I'd say adequately processed. Um, and lastly, validation. This is this um, process that we go through annually and we check that everybody's cleaning the same, that it's correct. And then we pop what we call a challenge load. We get the um, steriliser tech to come and we present them with a challenge load, which is really, you know, the toughest sort of load we're going to have all year. And they will do some basic testing, physical testing of time, temperature, pressure, and make sure our steriliser is giving us the results that are correct. So that's what we do with um, validation. The last part of validation, which you are expected to do, is to repeat that load and now put through very hard to kill bacteria called the little biological tests and send those off for um, um, send those off for incubation um, in the lab. Um, so this is what we do once a year. But some people think I'm just doing the steriliser. And no, actually checking our cleaning is adequate and that people are trained up and all that kind of thing. But we do put the steriliser through its hoops. And it means that if you've put through three um, suture um, sets as your maximum load with you know five instruments in each then you shouldn't be putting through four suture sets or five um, of course you can put through any number of um, that fit of um, singles 
So um, your, everybody who does sterilising should know what your validation load was, your challenge load, because you can't exceed that. And I think that brings us to the end of that Cook's tour. So I'd just like to make mention um, and of our evaluation that you'll all receive. Um, and if you could fill that in, that would be greatly appreciated. These webinars are monthly um, and we are addressing really based on questions that come in through the helpline. That is the topics that we are looking at to present. Um, the next topic is potentially around some of the, we've got a couple that are racing to the forefront at the moment. The first one is on wounds and the second one is on um, tier one, two and three. So outbreaks and managing and really unpacking the, all the information that sits behind the things that are being thrown at us at the moment. The other webinar I want to mention is that on the 15th of September, we actually have APNA uh, has a whole of Australia, a national webinar on COVID. So everything COVID, what is the current lay of the land? Um, what's the current data telling us? We're going to be talking about all the vaccines, all the training that we is coming and all we're expected to do. So pretty much answering all of those questions, hopefully, that you have around COVID. Uh, Dr. Ginny Mansberg is joining us uh, on that session, as well as um, Karen Booth, the APNA president, uh, and myself. So that will be advertised next week. So please watch out for that and jump on board. And for now, I'm going to hand back to Lisa just to close us off. Thank you. So again, just going back to um, our details, if you'd just like to get in contact with us about anything from today or anything that you're concerned about with your IPC. Um, and We'd just like to say thank you for joining us um, and we thank you uh, the support of the PHNs, um, obviously use your health direct and health pathways, um, but we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Sarah.